Yeah, see the body. Yeah. Okay, 911, what's your emergency? I have a home invasion. My niece is tied up. Can I talk to her? Is she able to speak? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, they had me tied up and they dragged me down the stairs to face my husband. And when my husband went in and faced me, they hit me in the face. He looked at me then and they said, do you want us to kill her? And he said, no. And they said, then tell us the truth. And he said, I don't know anything. Born on Christmas Day, 1985, Ernie Ibarra Jr was known to be a quiet but intelligent person who took an interest in computers at an early age. He loved to mess around with computers, period. He could tear one apart, put it right back together. He was very, very good at it. Ernie's friends affectionately call him Dagon, a nickname derived from one of the video games he played. Due to his interests, he worked towards his dreams and studied computers and technology. His life was generally on track until he met Samantha Wolford at a local tattoo shop was the moment that changed the course of his life. Samantha was four years younger than Ernie, and everybody liked her for her naturally bubbly personality. She was the eldest of three siblings and cared for her younger sister, Natasha, and brother, Daryl. Sam always had that mothering instinct. She was mama to the babies below her. She knew all along she wanted to be a mom. Her dream of becoming a mother became a reality earlier than expected when she got pregnant with her high school boyfriend. Her siblings were excited for her, especially when Samantha told them she was expecting twins. Unfortunately for Samantha, her dream of motherhood was tainted by the bad relationship she had with the father of her twins. Due to her partner leaving her, Samantha struggled to make ends meet. She tried multiple jobs, including a photographer for newborns and selling Mary Kay products while taking care of her twins. She made little ventures to make money and they were all unsuccessful. The life of a single mother was difficult. But it all changed on that fateful day in January 2008 when she met Ernie. She was instantly drawn to his dark and brooding gothic image. He had long hair, wore a long black trench coat and black boots, black pants. She liked the persona he put off. She liked uh, like mysteries. I guess he was a mystery that she was wanting to unravel. Ernie and Samantha's relationship was casual for the next couple of years. This changed when Samantha got pregnant with another set of twins in 2011, and Ernie was the father. In contrast to her previous relationship, Ernie was a proud father to their children. He jumped right into his role, and for a while, they were a happy family with a chaotic household of four children. The calm, tame stuff that she needed, and she was just the right amount of fun and crazy that he needed. I mean, they were like soulmates. By 2013, they welcomed their fifth child. With their growing family, Ernie persevered through the hardships of being their sole provider. He worked as a machine operator at a local bat manufacturing company while working part-time at Little Caesars. As a way to help bring in more income into the family, Samantha turned to making videos on YouTube. She spent her days making videos that mostly centered on her life as a mother and a few how-to videos in the mix. This played out perfectly for her because aside from being a mother, Samantha also had other dreams. I've always wanted to be an actress. I think it is so much fun. I've been extras in movies. I've had small parts in, in uh, like short films and I've done plays. I think it is so much fun and it is so beautiful. It is the, one of the most amazing forms of art ever to be able to express yourself that way. I think it's amazing. As they started feeling more like a family, the couple finally decided to tie the knot in March 2014 after years of living together. Marriage was the logical step for them, but this seemed to be the start of their relationship's downfall. As Samantha focused most of her attention on making her YouTube videos and striving to become the next internet star, she neglected her duties as a mother and wife. Eventually, Samantha even filed a complaint that Ernie had physically harmed her and her children in the summer of 2014. This allegation was not proven and was later denied by the family. However, this was only the beginning of the family's descent into chaos. Around 2 a.m. on February 20th, 2015, Rosie Wolford was out with her younger daughter, Natasha, for karaoke night. They were just about to head home when she received a panicked phone call from Samantha. My mom just looked horrified, and I'm like, what's the matter? She's like, your sister. She said, all I know is something about they took him. She said there was intruders, and apparently they have kidnapped him. Samantha claimed that someone had broken into their home and taken her husband. She was left behind by the intruders, but had been tied up. At that moment, 
Rosie was scared to death for her daughter and her family. They immediately drove to Samantha's home at Mount Pleasant, but it was an hour away, so she contacted her sister, Ginger, who only lived ten minutes away from her daughter's home. Ginger and her husband immediately went over and saw the broken down door. Upstairs they found the frightened Samantha, with her feet and arms tied up behind her, and her mouth gagged. Ginger immediately called the emergency services, but upon speaking to Samantha, the dispatcher noticed the woman was giving too many details on the call instead of getting help for her husband, who was in a more dire situation than her. Her focus was more on telling the story of what happened in the house. Shortly after the call was made, They hit me in the face, like, backhand slapped me, and so he looked at me then, and they said, I thought that would get your attention. Corporal Chris Durant and Deputy Ed Godoy of the Titus County Sheriff's Office arrived at the crime scene. Samantha had still been on the phone with the dispatcher when they arrived, and she quickly handed the phone to her aunt upon seeing the officers, allowing them to interrogate her. Walk me through what happened. I don't honestly know what happened. I was in bed asleep, okay. and we heard a noise, and this second I was able to open my eyes, and I saw my Despite her emotional testimony, however, the officers drew suspicion when Samantha recounted hearing the exact moment she heard one of the assailants' names down to their voice. That was all, that's only in, in identifying anything of God. One of them said, hey, look! And they got to her, but that's the only identifying anything of God. Her imitation of one of the assailants' voices sounded like she was trying to dramatize her story. Footage of her initial testimony showed that her voice may be emotional, but her face didn't express much concern for her husband, who was supposedly in danger at that very moment. The wife even walked the investigators around the house, showing them where they were sleeping. It was then that the officers discovered that the assailants had taken Ernie's phone with them, giving them hope that the man could still be found. At 2.30 a.m., the officer requested an emergency phone ping on Ernie's cell phone number. The private phone company was immediately contacted, and fortunately, they cooperated almost immediately. All the while, Samantha continued to give the officers all the small, gruesome details of what happened to her. They cut my shirt off, and then after they made me stand there mm -hmm. naked in front of him, threatening to do things to me. Mm -hmm. oh. They said his dad knocked on someone and got their man thrown behind bars, and now they were taking revenge and taking someone from him. Despite all these events that Samantha recounted, all of her five children remained asleep in their room. This drew further suspicion on her testimony, given that the quieter activities with the investigation managed to wake all her children when the supposed invasion didn't. Adding to this, the shirt she told the officers was also found downstairs, but it had no evidence that someone tried to cut it open. Giving the woman the benefit of the doubt, the officers continued their investigation and search of the house. The further they did, however, the more they noticed there were a lot of things that were off. Nothing was missing in the house. And though there were signs of struggle, it wasn't matching Samantha's claims. I'm not really seeing a whole lot of blood, though, for somebody that was pistol whipped. At around 3.01 a.m., the dispatch radioed in with vital information. A.M. Pistol bump scene. 0.86 miles from a resident in Pittsburgh. The phone company tracked Ernie's number and located the device in Pittsburgh. But the strange thing was that the phone was turned off moments after the location was revealed. As if on cue, the officer immediately asked the wife if she knew anybody from Pittsburgh, and she just shook her head, speechless. At around 3.20 a.m., investigator Chris Bragg arrived on the scene and pointed out more details that did not fit into Samantha's narrative. She had to repeat everything she told the officers, and minor details either disappeared or were added. We followed a pass, and we've arrested him before. Yeah. Assaulting her and the infant. Make sure she didn't do something to him and then stayed the scene to make it look like. Happened. The investigator took a brief look at the first floor, while Samantha recounted the events and the details of her story. When they got to the narrow spiral staircase, Bragg noticed that the house had an unusual design, so the assailants had to be familiar with its layout to do everything Samantha claimed to have happened. So they kick the door and they come up these stairs. Uh huh. And get them before they're able to know what's going on. Yeah, that's what the only part that's getting me is how do you. 
they would have to either be familiar with the place to be able to do all that and know where they were asleep. When they got upstairs, the lack of evidence was almost glaring for the investigator that he had to call Samantha to give him more details. Interestingly, she was no longer interested in discussing the events. Instead, she suddenly became defensive. Are you guys trying to accuse me of something? No. The abrupt answer seemed to have assured Samantha at that point, however. The wife moved on to a more strange question, leaving the officer baffled. What kind of gun is that? Her sudden interest in his firearm was a strange turn of events for someone who'd just been attacked and had her husband taken. Still, the officer told her that it was a Glock, but the woman kept prying, even asking to see it up close. Can I see it? Mm -hmm. Can I see it? Can you take it out? The officer cleverly deflected her request, telling her that if he did, he had to do paperwork. With this, the woman calmly reasoned that she wanted to compare it to the gun that the assailants had. I don't know guns, but the gun he had wasn't very big, or his hand wasn't very small, one or the other. It fit pretty closely to his hand size. After putting her children in her mother's care, Samantha was soon taken to the Titus County Sheriff's Office for additional questioning. There, the investigators got some sense of the disturbing truth of what really happened to Ernie Abara Jr. While alone inside the interrogation room, Samantha was recorded to have called her mother, complaining that she was sleepy and hungry. She then laid down on the floor as she gave her mother an order for some food, without a trace of worry for her missing husband. I'm gonna need no sausage. Let's get some gravy, no sausage and french fries. After some time, Bragg gave Samantha another set of standard questions, so she insisted on the involvement of Ernie's father. This time, she revealed another detail about her father-in-law. His dad has a problem with getting involved in things that he don't need to be getting involved with. Such as? Drugs. Since she opened up the topic of illegal substances, the investigator followed up on this. He asked if Samantha and Ernie were users, or if she and her husband had ever taken illegal substances in the past. Samantha confidently denied everything, and even offered to take a test to prove she was telling the truth. However, officers would soon learn that this contradicted how the couple's friends knew them. Because there was one that come out there that drove a little sli silver Jeep Liberty. He was supposed to be some kin to her, supposedly. But uh, I found out later from Jeremy Rule that he was her pill dealer. Samantha's words were becoming less and less credible in the eyes of the investigator. Her recollection of the events was no longer consistent, she gave different times of when she and her husband went to bed, then claimed she had taken sleeping medication to help her sleep, so she had trouble waking up when the attack happened. However, within seconds after that statement, she contradicted herself, claiming that her medicine also helped her wake up easily. As time went on, her story started to change because the reality is, when you tell the truth, the truth doesn't change. Samantha also told the tale of Ernie screaming at her not to call the police which led her to call her mother first instead of emergency services. He said, Sam, don't call the police. I don't care what happens. Don't call the police because they'll come back and they'll kill all the kids. <laughs> promise me. And he was screaming at me. And I was like, I promise. I promise. Then the investigator shifted gears and focused on Samantha's relationship with Ernie. It was a line of questioning that was undesirable for her. The investigator asked if there was any form of violence that happened between the husband and wife. This time, Samantha silently nodded and shook her head to answer the questions. After Bragg's questioning, Detective Tim Ingram came in and tried his hand at getting to the truth with Samantha. He told her that the evidence they found on the scene didn't match her story, so he urged her to be honest. Ernie's blood was found in his pickup truck, which didn't make sense because kidnappers wouldn't use the victim's vehicle to haul him out and then return the truck to the house. Samantha answered this with additional far-fetched details claiming that the assailants went to the vehicle to make sure they got the right guy. I told him that they got into his truck because they wanted his ID. It's because they said they needed to verify 100% they had the right person is what they said. The detective countered this simply by saying that it was a drop of blood. So Ernie was in that truck, not his kidnappers. With all the evidence stacked against her, the crying wife was placed as the top suspect. You don't have to be a suspect, and, and I still don't think you did it. I don't think you're strong enough to, to do it, but I, I personally, I think you're scared. I don't know if you had a boyfriend that he found out about. Samantha denied his theory and told him she was being as honest as possible. As the detective was about to leave the room, 
She asked about her phone that the officers had taken earlier. The detective did not tell her it was their most valuable evidence. Well, we've got to search for your phone. That phone's going to be ours for a while. Because the calls ever called you made probably within the past year, we're going we're gonna to have to look at. Okay. It's your text message, your thing. So we've got to search for your phone. Okay. A clear picture of distress was on Samantha's face when she learned that they were checking her messages. She tried to reason with the detective that she was telling everything that she knew. Given the panic in her voice, the officer went back inside to continue his interrogation, knowing that he was getting somewhere. How did you call for help if you tied up? I used my nose. Who, who did you call? My mother was the first number on my call list. I just used my face. Dropping this topic in the meantime, the detective then asked how she was in contact with multiple men on her phone. She reasoned that she had always wished she married somebody nicer like her father. He cheated on me more than once, and I think every once in a while to hear that I'm beautiful and to hear that I am an attractive person and that I am not the most horrible person in the world, it's nice. Again, her statement came off as strange for a wife whose husband is potentially in mortal danger. Relatives of kidnap victims don't often put their loved ones in a negative light. Yet Samantha willingly threw her husband's name under the bus to justify her friendships with other men. The interrogator used this as a waypoint toward the possibility of accomplices. He pointed out to her that one of those guys could have set the whole thing up and tried to make her single and available. Samantha grabbed onto this hypothetical theory and agreed that there might be someone she knew who could do it. She initially gave them the name of David Smith, her former friend. When the detectives confirmed that it was a dead end, he came back and suggested she take a polygraph test. Samantha refused, and the interrogator used this as a chance for a change in tactics. I think you're a liar what I think. I think you know exactly who did this, and I don't buy your freaking story for a minute. For several seconds, Samantha froze with her jaws slack and her body unmoving. She had finally realized that the police were not buying into her story. She had to save herself. That is the case that I, I do know who did it and why they did it. She broke down in tears and told the officer that she went to the hospital with her friend Sharla and she had a man there. Samantha told this man all about her personal life and how she was physically harmed by Ernie. How a man should treat a woman that way and how you don't do those things to a person. Okay. And and he's gonna deal with the situation. Okay. I didn't take him seriously. She pointed to John Sanford, Jose Jojo Ponce, and Octavius Tay Rhymes. To confirm this, the interrogator asked her if they did something inside the house for her to recognize them. She even gave a tip to the officers to check the hospital cameras on the day before the attack. A thousand percent particular, but I'm pretty sure it was him. The height and the, the weight and the way he was talking okay. all gangster. When asked earlier if she knew anyone from Pittsburgh, Samantha shook her head. The fact was that Octavius Rhymes and Jose Ponce were both residents of that area. Sanford and his brother-in-law, Ponce, were apprehended at the hospital at around 9.39 a.m. And a few minutes later, it was Sanford's turn in the interrogation room. He was wearing all black clothes that matched how Samantha described the assailants. John Sanford fully cooperated with the interrogation and told the story of what happened. Yes, sir, like you said, yeah, we talked to her about her problem with her husband and all that. Mm -hmm. Never did I plot to kill the guy. I had a problem with males hitting females. Sanford told the investigator that Samantha had been thinking of asking someone to physically harm her husband or set him up so he'd get in trouble. And I told her, I said, well, damn. I said, you're talking to somebody that could do that, but I wasn't going to, though. Sanford and Ponce told a similar story of how they got into the house, harmed Ernie to the point that he was unconscious, and took him outside onto the truck where his drip blood was found. They then drove to a remote part of the woods where somebody shot Ernie Ibarra Jr. and killed him, who pulled the trigger, though, was left a mystery by conflicting stories. Information vehicle, all I hear is pop. I Who's got the gun? Jojo. Who, who pulled the trigger then? Jonathan. Despite the conflict, they pointed out two key people who were closely involved in the crime. They both named Octavius Rhymes and the wife of the victim, Samantha Wolford, Sheriff Tim Ingram, investigator Aaron Baxter, and the cooperative John Sanford took off together to retrieve the body of Ernie. On the way, Sanford revealed to them more details of what happened, including the hows and the whys, which fit Ponce's account to a certain point. Samantha talking about her relationship with me and Tay and my sister and all that, and 
me try and talk to her and help her out and all that because she seems like a good person to me. They arrived at the remote part of the woods, and Sanford led them directly to Ernie's lifeless body, which they discovered at exactly 11.28 a.m. Jonathan Sanford had, had told us that his plan was initially to shoot Ernie, and then he decided not to, that he would slit his throat. And then before he had a chance to do that, Ponce shot him. After that, the officers broke into two teams. The first one handled Ernie's body, while the other brought Sanford along to retrieve the gun from Ponce's home. At the start, there was a moment of confusion about the gun's ownership, but Ponce's fiance, Lacona Slayton, soon cleared it. Which was it? Jonathan's. It, it was a gift to me from him. It was mine. Lacona Slayton also stated that they were all together that night before the attack. Afterward, the three men escorted Samantha and her five children home at around 10.30 p.m., according to cell tower records. This fact corroborated the details the private phone company disclosed to law enforcement when they inquired about Samantha's phone records. The first message she sent was at 2.30 a.m., according to the timestamp on Chris Durant's body cam, when she asked if she could contact her mother. Then, there was a second message at around 3 a.m., when she heard dispatch found the ping location in Pittsburgh. Text messages very clearly showed that she was the mastermind, that she was planning this, this wasn't an accident. She was an equal partner in all of this, not the innocent victim that she claimed to be. She may have been frustrated with her life. You know, obviously, 24-year-old mother, five children, money is a con was a constant struggle. Sanford and Ponzi were both charged with abduction and murder. They pleaded guilty and were sentenced to 50 years in prison. On the other hand, Octavius Rimes went to trial in two different counties and was collectively sentenced to 98 years. Samantha Wolford also had two trials. She was convicted of aggravated kidnapping and sentenced to 50 years. Then, a few months later, she was tried for the murder of Ernie Ibarra Jr. at Camp County, and the jury convicted her for 99 years on Thursday, September 14th, 2017. Her total sentence means that she'll likely be in prison for the rest of her life. It hurts that this happened. It not just hurts that we lost her, we lost him too. And those kids lost so much more than I did, so much more than they did. Those kids lost everything. Samantha had this warped way of thinking, this warped mental state, that this was going to be the way that she got out of her relationship with Ernie. The thing is, if her plan was successful and she didn't get caught, then certainly she would be the YouTube star that she's always wanted to be. This would get her a lot of attention and she could play victim. And I think that's what she wanted. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.